Hey everyone, I hope you are having a wonderful day so far. I am just dropping this special little clip into all the episodes. So no matter what episode you're listening to, this is actually pretty current as of July 2024. I wanted to come on here and just say a big thank you to Earworthy because the Life Shift podcast was just named the best overall podcast of the year in the first Earworthy Independent Podcast Awards. And you've probably seen some articles written about the Life Shift podcast before, written by Earworthy, and now he is launching, from his online publication, he is launching these yearly winners of independent podcast awards. And these are specifically for indie podcasters. We are those that wear all the hats. We create the show. Some people write the show. We're producers, sound engineers. We troubleshoot all the tech. We do any kind of research if we need to. We host the shows. We distribute the shows. We do all the things that relate to our shows because we love it. And it's so nice to see my name in a list with some other amazing podcasts like Multispective, which won Best Life Lessons podcast, Salad with a Side of Fries won Best Health podcast, Bippity Boppity Business won Best Business Advice podcast, and there are so many more. And so I just want to come on here and say thank you to Earworthy for not only doing these awards every year and just honoring some of us indie podcasters that sometimes feel like we're just shouting into the void, but we're not. We're just doing what brings us joy and hopefully through that work it brings other people joy in my case for the life shift i hope that each episode finds the ears that needed to hear it the most so that they feel a little less alone in their circumstance but also earworthy writes all these amazing publications pretty much weekly every week every weekday i should say where he writes on blogger medium substack tumblr vocal many stories and for other places, and he really just highlights the independent podcasters. So thank you, Frank, for everything you do with Earworthy and for recognizing all of us in the first Earworthy Independent Podcast Awards. If you'd like to read more, please head to medium.com forward slash E-A-R hyphen W-O-R-T-H-Y. Thanks again and enjoy this episode. This episode is sponsored by all the generous people that are on the Patreon feed for the Life Shift podcast. Thank you so much for supporting the production of the show. As you may or may not know, I do everything myself so far. And so this contribution to the production costs and software costs and hardware costs and all those things are so helpful. So thank you so much for your support. If you are interested in directly supporting the Life Shift podcast, you can head to patreon.com slash the Life Shift podcast. And there you can learn more about how to support the show. So thank you so much. And here is this week's episode. I was 29 years old. I ended a work day, shut my laptop, no issues whatsoever. And all of a sudden had a really uncomfortable tightening in my left upper arm. So, you know, I thought, I'm a young woman. Am I having a heart attack? Because it's on the left Mm. side. Kind of what's going on? Went to my husband because it wasn't getting better after about maybe 10 minutes. And I said, this is weird, but can you just like look at my arms? Do they look weird to you? My arm just hurts. And the look on his face was like he had just seen a ghost. His only words were, you need to get to an emergency room right now. My guest today is Robin Daigle. She's an entrepreneur who really rose from the ashes, if you will, of a life-altering medical condition that was very sudden. And she turned adversity into a springboard for an incredible personal and professional growth. She found herself at the crossroads of life when she was diagnosed with thoracic outlet syndrome, which is really a rare condition that compresses your veins and your nerves or your arteries from your chest to your arms. Robin's tale is one of courage, and her battle with this condition and all the little life shifts that ensued is truly a testament to the strength that we have inside of all of us. Much of our conversation today is about how her diagnosis, her surgeries, and her recovery period sparked this introspection and a reevaluation of her priorities, which ended up leading her to discover an entrepreneurial spirit she hadn't known she had. A crucial theme that resonates throughout Robin's journey is the importance of embracing and adapting to life's unforeseen changes. Robin's story teaches us that even in the face of fear and uncertainty, we can find strength, create joy, 
and discover new paths that we never thought were possible. So without further ado, here is my conversation with Robin Daigle. I'm Matt Gilhooley, and this is The Life Shift, candid conversations about the pivotal moments that have changed lives forever. Hello, my friends. Welcome to the Life Shift Podcast. I am here with Robin. Hello, Robin. Hello, Matt. Thank you for wanting to be a part of the Life Shift Podcast and, you know, just tell your story. I found through this journey that everyone's story has a little element that I can relate to or resonate with, even if I didn't experience, you know, anything remotely like what my guest has has said or shared. So thank you for just wanting to be a part of this. Of course. Thank you for, you know, bringing me on and letting me share my story. Really excited. And for, well, for listeners, this is your first podcast experience. And so I'm sure you've shared your story with many people, but maybe not in this way. Yeah. I'm really excited to just be able to, you know, continue the reach with my story and hope that somewhere, someone, you know, feels the same way I did and knows that there's a light at the end of the tunnel and you will get there. And I promise you will. (laughs) I, it's so important. And really, I mean, you hit on the reason that I started the life shift and, and the idea of if someone out there is listening and they hear someone going through something similar or they feel a similar way, if nothing else, they feel less alone in their exactly. experience. Because I think sometimes we hit these experiences where maybe logically we know we're not the only ones to ever go through it, mm-hmm. but it sure does feel like we are, are the only ones that could ever understand what's happening. And so it is It is my goal that there's someone out there listening right now that hears your story and feels less alone or feels hope or inspiration. So you hit it right on the I, mark. I cannot agree more. <laughs> well, for anyone listening, anyone listening for the first time because Robin is on the show, the Life Shift podcast really started, it stems from my own personal experience. When I was a kid, my mom died in a motorcycle accident. And from one day to the next, my life was completely different. My life shifted immensely. And around that time, there was not a lot of people talking about mental health or helping an eight-year-old grieve or any of those things. And I felt really alone in my circumstance. And I wondered, as I grew up and as I went through the grief journey, are there other people out there that have like this significant, seemingly small moment in time that changed everything. And it turns out that there are a lot of people with a lot of life shift moments and, you know, but, but when you're, when you're in that cycle of grief, you just don't realize it. And so I'm just so lucky to be able to talk to over a hundred and something people now about their life shift moments. So again, thank you for, for wanting to do this before we jump into your story though, maybe you can tell us a little bit about who Robin is in 2024 and what your life is, is like here. So today I am an entrepreneur. I own and operate a charcuterie catering company. We are just a year and a half in. I never thought I'd ever be working for myself, let alone start my own business. But here we are. We are chaotic. We're fun. We're crazy. Some days we don't know what weighs up, (laughs) but we thrive in it. We love it. I have an incredible little mini labradoodle. His name's Napa. I have an incredible husband named Ian. And we just, the three of us, are trying to just live our best lives, right? Every single day, we just pick what makes us happy today. And that's what we're going to do. So, you know, we'll dive into the story, but my story is the reason why I am an entrepreneur today, why I have started my business. So, really, when you say life shift, it, my entire life, has been on a total yeah. different trajectory since, you know, everything has happened. And I just can't wait to continue to see what the future has in store for me, my family. Yeah. Were you always someone that, I mean, maybe not the way you just set that up, but were you always someone that like kind of grabbed life by the horns and kind of like went after whatever was feeling right? Yes and no. Um, <laughs> meaning... I was always so busy with everything Mm. else going on around me. You know, I look back five, even 10 years ago, my husband and I have been together for almost 12 years now. And we look back and think how many, you know, years, I don't want to say wasted because waste is not the right word. Um, Right. We're just consumed with, you know, 
doing everything for everyone else, Mm. right? Family events, family, you know, weddings, friends, weddings, everything, right? I mean, life gets busy. Those are all amazing things. And we were so happy to be a part of every single thing. But our weekends were never for us. Mm. They were always for everyone else in our family. And we were always go, 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 just in a very different way. Right. Not intentional. Right. It wasn't like getting the most out of life in the way that you wanted, but you were still getting a lot out of life because it was meaningful things. It wasn't always. It's all we knew. We were loving life right back then. It was, oh, we get to see our friends this weekend and next weekend and the weekend after that, the weekend (laughs) after that. Um, We're just, yeah. Part of my question stems from the idea of, I, I talk to a lot of people I've personally experienced this, but like so much of my growing up as a teen, going into my 20s, I was very much like what I thought I was supposed to do in life. I was mm-hmm. supposed to do the next thing. And then, okay, well, you graduate high school. Now you need to go to college and it needs to be a good college and you need to do well. And then you need to, you know, get a job. And, you know, all these things were just... I don't think of my own doing. They weren't like things that I was like, yes, can't wait to do that. It was just like, I was just the next thing I had to do because so-and-so, whoever so-and-so was, said that I needed to do it. So that's kind of where that question yep. came from. But were I, you, do you buy I into that? I cannot agree more. Cannot. Okay. For me, you know, I grew up in a house where my parents are entrepreneurs. They started their own company at the age of 30. I mm. started my company when I was 30. So I grew up just in that business environment and I said, well, I guess this is my parents do. I guess I'll go to business school. Mm -hmm. So I went to a wonderful business school here in Mass. And when I was there, it was, oh, well, you're a marketing major. You need a corporate job. Mm -hmm. That's what you do. So of course, right out of college, got recruited, went right into corporate marketing for 10 years. Didn't think anything of it. Played the game. Every day Did you like it? No. Oh, Okay. (laughs) <laughs> so it was just like you you knew that you had to go somewhere for 40 Correct. hours and yep. come home with a check and yep. then spend two hours every night decompressing so you could do it again the next day. Exactly. But I didn't know any different. I didn't know right. that there was anything else out there, right? Because we did what we were told to do. You go to yeah. college, you graduate, you get a job. You don't like that job anymore, you get another job in the corporate space, which I did. I worked at two wonderful companies when I was in corporate, but it never fed my soul. Mm-hmm. It was more of, almost like a robot, right? You wake up, you go to work, you come home, you eat dinner, you go to bed, repeat the next day. Yeah. There was Is no that why you guys were were filling the weekends and the nights with like all the family and friends and things because you exactly. thought maybe that will satisfy that little... Exactly. We were like, well, at least we have, you know, friends to look forward to or a family party this weekend, something fun, right? Get out of the yeah. house, especially when COVID hit too, right? We we were both work from home permanently. Yeah. I mean, after COVID, I was still work from home permanently. So that was just kind of, you know, I just need to get out of this house at this point in time. So what do we have planned this weekend that we can go do and see people and not, you know, be yeah. just the two or three of us with the dog just in a house all day long, 40 hours right. a week. And I think so many people can relate to the idea of just kind of going through the motions and to your point where you were like, it's not regret. It's not looking back on like waste. Mm -hmm. You were doing things and you were trying to find the joy in the things that you felt like you had to do. But at the same time, you're like, hmm, did I choose these things? Mm -hmm. It's really, it's really interesting. And I think there's a lot of connections that I can personally relate to in that. And so that's why I wanted to ask that, but maybe you filled in a couple little pieces, but maybe you can kind of like paint the picture of your life leading up to really what changed things so that you could grab life by the horns and just like run after it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I mean, I was always the, the planner. I was like, I said, go, go, go all the time. I didn't know how to sit still how to relax really, because that was just my life, right? We are constantly on the go. And was there a fear in that, by the way? There wasn't because again, it's all I knew. I didn't know anything different. But Um, like, was there a fear of not moving and not being busy all the time? And that, uh, do you feel like you were busy because you had to, because I I don't don't know what I would do. Yeah, no, I, I, I honestly don't there there was a fear because I honestly 
don't remember a weekend that we didn't have something. Mm. Like, and, and so I'm not, fill it I'm up. not, yeah, I am not joking <laughs> Yeah, uh, wow. because if, if there was a weekend that we didn't have something, like we would still go out and do something. Oh, we don't and have a wedding this weekend. Let's go out with our friends or let's go on a nice hike. Got it. So we were always still doing something. Yeah. Sitting down, relaxing, binge watching a Netflix show was never unheard of. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was <laughs> unheard of in my household. <laughs> so for me, right, just go, go, go all the time. I was a huge gym rat, right? Like I looked forward to it. That was my therapy. And again, it just kind of go, go, go. You wake up at five, you go to the gym, you do the work, blah, blah, blah. You know the drill. Mm -hmm. um, until February 15th, 2022. Is that your day? That was my I'm day. I'm assuming that's your day. <laughs> that's my day. And that day is special to me as well. Um, Obviously, like we'll dive into everything that happened and my Go moment and everything. Jump in. Um, but it's a special day for me because I always say everything happens for a reason, right? I'm all going to get very emotional during this as well. A couple of years back on February 14th, so Valentine's Day, my grandmother passed away completely unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. And I remember on the fifth, like obviously, we, I remember her always on the 14th and on the 15th. I remember thinking like that morning, like, oh, like grandma's always like looking down at us. Like she always watches over everyone, like just having really good positive, you know, thoughts with that really sad moment. But later that night is when my life changed forever. I was 29 years old. I ended a work day, shut my laptop, no issues whatsoever. And all of a sudden had a really uncomfortable tightening in my left upper arm. So, you know, I thought, I'm a young woman. Am I having a heart attack? Because it's on the left mm. side. Kind of what's going on? Went to my husband because it wasn't getting better after about maybe 10 minutes. And I said, this is weird, but can you just like look at my arms? Do they look weird to you? My arm just hurts. And the look on his face was like he had just seen a ghost. Mm. He his only words were, you need to get to an emergency room right now. So of course, I'm thankful that I live 10 minutes away from one of the best emergency rooms in Massachusetts yeah. in Salem. And we rushed there immediately. It was still when it, the second wave of COVID had just kind of come back in the hospitals. So it was really back to very strict protocols. Mm -hmm. um, so I was dropped off at my the emergency doors. And by the time I got there, I was completely purple from my fingertips to my shoulder. Oh, God. And wow. I'm not exaggerating when I say I looked like Barney. I was completely cold. I had no and completely like numb, mm. painfully numb, like pins and needles through my whole right. arm and so swollen. And it was just getting progressively worse progressively as it was going worse. on. Yep. I was pacing around the emergency room, convinced that they were cutting my arm off. Right. Well, um, and, naturally, I think a lot uh, of us yeah. would feel that way. Yep. So fast forward, you know, they finally get me situated in a room. I can now have a guest. My mom came and sat with me because I was just off my rocker and I needed someone to calm me down. Right. Right. Because yeah. we spiral. I think exactly. we start thinking about like, well, maybe I'm going to die. Off. Exactly. Well, you know, like, like, why yeah. is my arm purple? What is going on? Like, I feel mm -hmm. fine. I can breathe fine. But what is clearly something is going on with me. They did a big ultrasound, and later that night, a couple hours later, the doctor came in and said, you know, we think we know what's wrong, but it's a very rare condition, so we're not going to say anything until we, you know, really get the final results. That's terrible. I was like, It's like okay. a terrible response. <laughs> They're yeah. like, but we think it's something with blood clots, so we're going to start you on blood thinners. <laughs> so get put on the blood thinners, and they're like, well you're not going home tonight. So we're going to get you a room and then we'll check back in with you in the morning. That seems like a long time to wait with your arm like that. I was in the waiting room, waiting room for almost 45 minutes before I even went into a room. And then when I was in the room, it was probably another six hours That's before so I got put on blood, th blood thinners. Uh, and then overnight, they're like, then you had to wait overnight. Mm-hmm. Um, and of course, I have everyone saying, what's going on? Are you okay? And of course, I'm right. overwhelmed. I can't move my left arm. So I'm working on one hand at a time. Of course, all the pain medication you're on, just 
wasn't a good situation. And due to all the COVID restrictions, I was only allowed to have one guest for four hours a day. Mm. That was it. So at this point in time, it's overnight. Obviously, I don't have anyone with me. It's the next morning. And this is where my moment kind of really changed everything. My surgeon walks in the door and says, you know, has anyone spoken to you about what's going on? Of course, my heart is just racing. I'm by myself. Um, knowing something bad is going to come out of his mouth. And he said, well, good news. <laughs> what you have is most likely fixable. Bad news. It's going to be a very long journey. Mm. So in that moment, I just, you know, had a, okay, you know, big girl pants on, w- bring it. What's going on? And he said, you have a rare condition called thoracic outlet syndrome. And that means that your veins, nerves, or, and or arteries from your chest that flow to your arms have been compressed and damaged by the compression of your clavicle and your first rib. Mm. Fun fact, your first rib is right underneath your clavicle bone. A lot of people were surprised by that. So what happened for me was my veins were completely spiderwebbed internally with scar tissue Mm. because of the compression happening years over years over years. Now, he told me this, and of course, I immediately just start crying. But all I remember, it's, it was kind of like a movie for me, almost like being a fly on the wall looking at this kind of unraveling. He explained to me that you're going to be in the hospital for a week right now. We need to do surgery. But in order to do that, we need to get your blood to a certain level. Mm. It can't be too thin or you'll bleed out during surgery. Right. Or it can't be too thick because then we can't do the surgery. So it had to be just right. And then in a month, you're going to go into MGH in Boston and you're going to have to have your first rib taken out. And then from there, a month later, you're going to come back here and you're going to do another surgery to go back in and remove any remaining blood clots in any of your veins. Mm. I felt in that moment confusion. I was petrified. My life changed. Yeah. And what I mean by that is I wish I saw, I wish there was a mirror for my face because seeing my doctor's reaction to my face told me everything I needed to know. Here I am, 29 years old, being told that you have a serious blood blood condition at the time. Your entire left arm is clotted. The blood is not draining back into your body like it should be. (laughs) You're going to be here for a week. So say goodbye to any work or any weekend plans, right? Any busyness. Yeah, you're going to have to sit with yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a long road. You have three more surgeries. I hadn't even had three surgeries in my life. Mm -hmm. And your life's going to change. It's going to be different. And what that looked like at that time. Yeah was just a giant black hole for me because in that moment I needed to process what was happening to me, process what was being told to me in my plan for my health, and then try to relay that to my family Oh yeah, via a phone call, which is just the most disconnected feeling you possibly could have because I couldn't imagine trying to FaceTime anyone right then and there. Mm -hmm. Um, I was, it's interesting when you, when you first heard that information from the surgeon, did you attach to more the, the things that were going to change or did, were you someone that kind of attached to the hope that like, Oh, this could be fixed. It was was more like there was no hope, even though he said that you didn't hear that part or no, you did hear it, but I, you I chose heard it, to attach I, to that other part. Right. I heard you're going to have a long couple of months. You're going right. to have to undergo a major really surgery. Hard. Right. Yeah. Your rib is going to be c- taken yeah. out of your body. <laughs> and you got enough. 
You have yeah. enough. You have enough of those ribs, yeah. right? Yeah. Well, and you know, it's interesting too because we started this conversation about how busy you were, like how busy your life was, like just because that was the natural tendency for you to exist in this. And then here you are at a complete stop, like complete. So I, I would imagine that is jarring for someone that is always on the go, go, go doing, doing, doing. And now you're like, guess what? Yeah. You might not be able to do any of that for a long time. When I, t- so I was an account manager when this was happening and <laughs> I was like picking up phone calls, like trying oh, to I deal bet. with my clients, like in the hospital bed. And finally, I yeah. was like, I ca- I can't keep doing this, but like that's all I knew. That's all I wanted to keep doing. Yeah, I think and... we're very conditioned in that sense. I think there's something. I'd be curious to like dig into, like if you ever do this, and if you, like dig into why that tendency. Like I know you say it's always just like something you yeah. did, but I I wonder if there was a trigger for that because. Yeah. You know, I don't know if you've read this in this journey of healing, and we'll talk about this journey that you've gone on, but have you ever read the book, The Body Keeps the Score, or any of these kind of like trauma books? Mm -mm. I talk to a lot of people about these, like people that get these physical ailments or whatever, and I'm not saying that this is your journey, but it's always so interesting to me how stories like you know, I did this and I was doing this and I was, you know, whatever I was doing these hard things or climbing mountains or whatever it was. And then all of a sudden sudden my body said, hold on a second, Mm -hmm. we're going to stop this because it's not long-term, it's not healthy. So not putting that on you as that something, but it might be something really interesting to look into to like think, oh, I wonder if my body was like, hey, hey, Robin, yeah, you need to slow down. down. Like life is here and you probably want to live it in the way yeah. that you want. I was supposed to go on a snowboard trip to Killington two weeks after. And when I tell you, like to the day I was getting discharged, you sure I can't go on that snowboard trip? Yeah, two <laughs> weeks. doctor was like, I do I need to keep happen. you here so you don't even right. try to go on that snowboard trip? <laughs> yeah. Was <sighs> there a point in, in that where, like at what point did you accept it? Did you say, okay, this is now what I have to do. And this is how my life is going to be. So it it got accepted in stages, I'll say. Um, So for me, my first level of acceptance, honestly, was like 30 seconds after that, because I looked at myself and, you know, like I said, I'm a person who go, go, goes, but I'm also usually the person that takes care of everyone around me. Mm-hmm. Like I'm always, what do you need? What do you need? What do you need? Oh, I'll get to myself eventually. And I'm also yeah. as vocal and loud that I usually am. Like I'm always a social butterfly, but I'm also very reserved at the same time. Like I like to sit back and kind of observe. Like I'm never one to kind of jump forward or really kind of defend any way, shape, or form or like confront. So for me, right? My surgeon comes in, tells me everything, gives me the plan, Saint wrote it all on the whiteboard so I could take pictures of it and try to really kind of process it. He even hands me a tissue and it's like, I know this is a lot to try to take in, but I'm here. But for me, I had to accept what I was just told and try to process it as quick as I can because I had to make phone calls and, you know, Mm -hmm. and tell my family, I'm going to be here for at least a week. So you guys need to figure it out. And then trying to explain, you know, not only explain, but for me, I felt like I couldn't cry or show my emotion. So I you had to be strong one. Exactly. I had to be the strong one. Um, because so, you wanted to take care of them because you were worried that correct. they would worry. Correct. And I knew they were worrying. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, but so in my brain, I kind of flipped, I call it like the light switch. Like I like turned my emotions off. And I really just, I called my family, black and white, explained to them what was happening, tried my best not to cry, not to show emotion, just stick to the facts. And that worked. And I had never done that before. Mm. (laughs) So I was already seeing changes in myself because of this one thing that had just happened to me within the last 12 hours. Yeah. Um, But do you think that turning that off, quote unquote, worked? Or do you think it was just kind of pushing things down and oh, it for pushed a later things date? down <laughs> for a much later date. 
<laughs> yeah. So um, I get that. I get that though, because, you know, as someone that wants to take care of other people, right? even in a dire moment uh-huh. of your own, you're still putting others ahead. When okay. they probably were like, if they heard that, yeah. they were probably like, what are you doing? I, I, I eventually told them that after months of therapy, um, right. Um, right? I like sat everyone down and just finally it was like, come to Jesus moment. Yeah. And they were <laughs> um, like, you didn't have to do that. Exactly. But that's me, right? Um, that's what we do. Yep. So kind of, you know, that week came and went, had my surgery, came home. And in between that and my rib removal was about four to six weeks. And in that time frame, I was out of work, obviously. I had severe restrictions. I couldn't physically, I mean, even doctor's orders, but physically, I could not move my arm past here. I couldn't stretch my arm straight. I couldn't do anything with my left side at all. Right. And that forced me to slow down. To sit with yourself. To sit in binge How did that Netflix. Go? <laughs> How did uh, that go though? Like, did that, was that like a total like it, brain exercise for you? It was such an emotional roller coaster because I, I couldn't do anything. I, I cook, I clean, not because those are the housewife duties, because I truly love to do that stuff. Like, that brings me joy. When I'm stressed, I clean and I cook and like that's my jam, but I couldn't do any of it. Yeah. And that started driving my anxiety wild. Yeah. So you wild. have no routine. Like your routine of 29 years is now gone. Shot. The window. Yep. Nothing. I wasn't sleeping at night because just the pain was so bad. Mm. So I was just sleeping as much as I could 24 seven. Right. Yeah. Barely getting out of bed because does depression come along with that? Oh, too? depression hit the nail okay. on the head about a month later. Yeah. Well, I mean, that, uh, those those things, even though that's pain induced, yeah. I think sometimes we lend to those too. It's like it's easier to be asleep, yes, than to deal with anything else. Deal with reality. life, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. I get that. Um, I mean, I had to. This is going to get even like very vulnerable. I was twenty nine years old, and I couldn't take a shower by myself. Right. Couldn't yeah. brush my hair, braid my hair. I had to teach my husband everything. Yeah. And, to all and the you women had to rely here, on people. To the women out here listening, trying to teach your husband how to braid hair is a chore. But I had to rely Those on Barbies people. Those Barbies out. Yeah, seriously. I had to rely on people. I had to depend on people. I had to be vulnerable. Yeah. And When all along in your whole life, you probably could have. Yep. But, but I never chose w- not to. Yep. Right. And the hardest part, other than recovery, obviously. Right was allowing people to help. Yeah. That took weeks and that didn't happen until after my rib removal. Mm. So, fast forward to day of rib removal surgery, heading into Boston, I'm ecstatic because I just can't wait for this to be over and put behind me, right? So you can get back to work. Literally. <laughs> Honestly, I'm like, I just need my life back. Come on, come on. Yeah, Let's just get yeah. this over and done with. There's yeah. a light at the end of the tunnel. Like I was still I get it. weirdly positive. Yeah. But I went into surgery, came out of surgery, opened my eyes. And this is like kind of another moment for me. I thank God my husband was in the room because I looked at him and he just saw the expression on my face and he just said, You're okay. There were complications in surgery, but you're gonna be okay. So my surgery is about twice as long as it should have been. And when he was in, you know, my area of my thoracic area and my brachial plexus, he found so much damage Mm. to my nerves that he equated fixing my nerves on my brachial plexus to scraping cement off of the side of the road. Mm. So obviously when you cause that much agita to your entire nervous system on your arm, you're going to have angry nerves. Yeah. So when I woke up, I had zero sensation of my left mm. arm. I didn't even know I had a left arm pretty much because I just could not feel it. I could not move it. I could barely touch it. It hurt so bad mm. when I did try to touch it. It was just so excruciatingly painful. So that added a whole nother layer now to my thoracic right. outlet syndrome story, now to my recovery. 
nerves can take up to two years to regenerate if they even regenerate. Right. Very sensitive. So today it's, you know, mid-June 2024. I still don't have some sensation in my arm. Mm. And they can't tell me if that will ever come back. Right. You know, during that time, you know, I was told we did our best, but I don't know if your coloring will ever return back to normal. We don't know if you'll ever have full use of your arm. We don't know if you'll ever be able to lift it above your head again. When they went in, there were so many more unknowns. Right. Where I just went back to that exact same, like numb, confused feeling again. And I felt like it was. Was there anger involved at all? There was slight anger, but I felt like it was more towards just the fact that I had to slow down. I didn't have a choice. Mm. So there's no like anger at like the process or like you didn't know that this was a chance or. Right. There was no anger in that aspect because I knew, honestly, I have to say my surgeon was phenomenal. He has a, he created a thoracic outlet program in Boston. It's the only one in the country. Like people fly in all over to see him from Australia, every which way he's seeing people from all over the world. How weird that you're like down the street from Mm. this. And I always say I count my blessings. I'm so thankful to live in a place that we are because if not, who would have known what would have happened? Right. But yeah, just kind of surviving, right? I I kind of just went into that like fight or flight mode in in my brain. I was like, let's just survive right now. Don't try to worry on anything else. We just need to survive. Um, yeah. and you know, after hearing, you know, you may never be the same again Yeah. after this surgery, not knowing that was even a chance that kind of threw a whole new wrench into this ball game. Right. I was even more scared now. Well, right. what does life look like now? At least previously I had, you'll get back to normal. Right. And now a month I can later, get back to busy. Right. And now a month later is mm-mm, your mm, life. We don't know. Correct. We don't know. And that's awful. Like the doctors felt guilty even having to say like, we don't know, but that's just the truth about life. You know, he said, he goes, I had, you know, an old lady have the surgery and within a day she was walking out of here, but you're a very healthy 29 year old. And I was Mm -hmm. in the hospital for double the amount of time because my pain was so severe. I was on so much pain medication because of just the nerve damage. It right. was wild. My surgeon just said like he had never seen a case like this yeah. before. Typically with thoracic outlet, like there's symptoms that lead up to all of this happening. It doesn't just happen like that, like my case. Did. Right. Yeah. So do they know, like, is there like, can you pinpoint how it, how they, it manifested or is it genetic? Think- So they think it happened because of my bone structure, just, you know, how I was born. And a lot of people that happens like D1 athletes, a lot of pitchers, volleyball players, obviously I'm not that. So they, their kind of natural conclusion. It's not obvious. Oh, thanks. (laughs) So their kind of like natural conclusion was, you know, some people can just be born with, I think they called it like a skinny thoracic area whatever that means. So latest trend. Yeah, apparently. (laughs) So kind of fast. Let me ask you. Yeah. Were you, were you, this is me assuming, but based on how you've described your life before, were you someone that was always like, there's always a black and white answer to things, or you always had wanted a definitive and this, I don't know from your doctor was like scarier than someone saying like, no, you're definitely not going to be able to use your arm. Like, yes. Yep. I wanted at least, you know, then you can plan. Yep. Right. Yeah. I asked, I was like, well, like, what about in a year from now? And he was like, I I cannot in my right, you know, as a doctor tell you anything because we don't know. Right. So that was obviously a giant pill to swallow. Because you can't plan if you don't know. Can't plan if you don't know. That's challenging for challenging for a planner. (laughs) Well, that's Uh, a lesson that I think that probably changed you in a way. Right. It kind of combining, you know, all the unknowns of what my life was going to look like, right? Heck, I didn't know I had nerve damage, right? Until they went in there and saw it. Um, I tried to twist it to be a positive Hmm. of, 
We don't know like all intentional of, forced. Right. Intentional. Anything? Because when I had come home from the hospital, again, all of this happened so fast, right? I never really had the time to research what was happening to me, to actually process what was happening to me either. It was just you're going in for surgery. You're in the hospital for a week. You're home. You're recovering. You're back in for another rib taken out. Then you're home. Now you're back a month later. It was just go, go, go again for my life. But in that time frame, I had to stop and be vulnerable, be open, you know, allow others to help. I couldn't cut my own food. I couldn't feed myself. <laughs> um, That's very humbling. It, it when I tell you I couldn't do anything. Um, And the guilt that comes with that is extraordinary. I had to sleep in a recliner in my living room for two months because I physically could not lay down without pain. So the experience of being cut off, right, from, I mean, I would have people come over and visit, but they were on the couch, right? I like I just had no physical connection, right? For two months. So the depression. Just with yourself. Yep. Just with myself and all my thoughts. And, and all my thoughts and all my thoughts and my pain and all my thoughts of, oh, that's not how I would put the dishes away, or that's not how mm-hmm. I would fold the laundry. But at the end of the day, it just kind of kept be- coming back to well, you can't do it all, Robin. So you have to give up that control, which is something I have never done. Never. Have you <laughs> uh, learned? Yes, now. Now we're, we're great at it. <laughs> yeah. We delegate like a pro. Um, yeah. But through all of this, it just really taught me two, bi- two major life lessons. One, when you need help, there's nothing to be ashamed of to get that help. No. It but we assume me, it. Yeah. It took me, I kind of tying back to the beginning of this podcast, I thought I was alone, right? Yeah. Of course, every day everyone's reaching out. How are you feeling? How are you feeling? And there finally got to a point where one of my very close friends said, stop sugarcoating it. Mm-hmm. How are you feeling? Right. And that's kind of what started, you know, everything for me was breaking that kind of glass ceiling of, oh, I can share my emotions. I can share that, you know, I'm really not doing good. I've watched yeah. four seasons of Vampire Diaries in a day and a half. What am I doing with my <laughs> <Right>. life? <laughs> yeah, uh, so it was like a cut the bullshit moment it of really like a was. friend telling you to like well, snap good. out of That's it. That's a good friend. Hope um, you're hope you're still friends with that person. To this day, I cannot imagine my life without her. And yeah. she's been through it all, and it just so happened that she was able to really share some great insight. And, and sometimes that led- it's, it's, you have to get to that point though. I feel like mm-hmm. sometimes someone might've said that to you six months before that. Someone exactly. might've said that to you a thousand times before, but like at that moment when there's just a it. little light peeking through the c- crack, she was like, yep. let's go. We're yep. going in. We're cracking exactly. this. Cause I felt alone. I felt no one yeah. else feels like this before. No one else is going through what I'm going through. And I'm then- a burden. Exactly. I'm a, this, I'm, I'm, I'm a can't burden. do everything. Mm-hmm. The amount of times I would say, I'm sorry to ask you one more thing. Can you fill up my water? Or I know you just sat down, but I'm so sorry. Can you do this? And I was like, stop being sorry for asking for things that you need because everyone around you knows you can't physically do anything. And they also wouldn't offer if they weren't being serious. That is one thing I want everyone to hear. People don't offer to help if they're not serious about helping. That was something. And then, you know, for me reaching out for help, my friend really helped me see that I needed the help because when I tell you, like this gets me emotional, imagine getting your rib taken out and then curling up in the fetal position on a floor, crying hysterically for no reason. And my husband would just literally like coddle my head in his lap. And it got to that point where I think I did that for about a week straight. And I said, I think I need help. Something, something Good. is not okay. So I think, s- I mean, I think that's important. I mean, a week, a lot a of people week. wouldn't realize that even in a week, yeah. you know, and it's, and he was, the a body dark. will do things that we cannot explain. I was just crying all the time. I was yeah. so depressed. And I never thought I'd ever get depression in a million years, right? Right. 
Uh, Were you too busy to get depressed? Exactly. Why before? Why would I be depressed? I'm just always on the go, right? Now that yeah. I'm still sitting with my thoughts, now I'm depressed. Wow, that must suck. Um, but it but was it's not even day. that. I mean, yeah, it's it's not even, I think there's like this, I think there are a lot of people that seemingly are happy or busy or living a amazing life that can still feel depression or anxiety or yeah. all the things because guess what? We're all human and all- those are all like parts of it. And I, you know, I hate that the way to finding this, this joy in being a human and this joy in letting other people help you and helping them find happiness too, because I think there's happiness that comes with helping other people, which, you know, you yep. used to help people and that brought you happiness. Yep. I think, it sucks that like such a tragic piece of your life brought you to this, what seemingly is a good version of you. Like it's weird to look at it that way, right? That's what I always say. People, you know, to this day, it's almost, it's been over two years now, right? Um, It feels like just yesterday for me, obviously. And people always say like, well, how'd you overcome that? Like what, like what? And for me, I gave myself no choice kind of after the therapy and all of that processing. Mm. Um, But I kind of was like, you know, look at your life now. You're happy, right? If this horrible thing didn't happen to you, what would your life have been like? So yeah, (laughs) as horrible of a situation that I had to endure and my family had to endure and how scary that was, Right. I'm so thankful it happened because yeah. it just brought my relationships with every single person in my life that much closer. You know, what is that phrase? It takes a village. I, my village came out yeah. and I am so thankful for the village that I still have to this day. Um, yeah. They know who they are and my friends literally were dropping everything to come help watch our dog right for the day while my husband was in the hospital with me um they they would come and entertain my husband so he didn't have to think oh my wife is just sitting at a hospital bed by herself crying and in pain and you see what love looks like in a different way i think yes i think when you face something like this i think you see beyond the performative aspect of love that I think sometimes we just kind of are conditioned to see, or it's just kind of the expected version of love. And this is where you see like, you oh, dive, you dive in. Yeah. The, these people really actually care. physically care yeah. and they want to help. It's not like this performative, like, no, oh, I got you a present or I, exactly. My, you know, it's like, it's very, it's very raw, I guess very. is maybe the best way to, to see that. Raw it's interesting too, because you come in, we come into this conversation. I don't know too much. You gave me a little bit of information about your story and you've told, and you've walked through, and I know this is, these are just pieces of your journey. There's a lot more that comes along with it. But the one that stands out to me the most is the moment that your friend really got real with you. Mm -hmm. Because all the other pieces were like, you had to go along with it, right? Like you had to like, go with the surgery. You had to listen to the doctor. You had to do all these things. But this was like where you were like, like there is a choice that I need to like process. And it's it's just so fascinating, the power of language and the power of words and how the right moment, right time, right words can sometimes change everything. Everything happens for a reason. And that's what I've said since all of this has started. I mean... Good for you. I don't know if I totally buy into that. <laughs> Only I, because, I know. you know, it's, it's hard. Tough. I, I, It's tough. It is tough because I don't know. Is there, I, I don't know if we say that to ourselves because I've, I've mm-hmm. said these things too. I don't know if we say that to ourselves to make us feel better yeah. or if we really, I if don't I re- know if I really believe it for me because I think back, you know, like why would my mom die at 32? Right. Is was there a reason for that? But then I can go along with the idea of like, I wouldn't be this version of Matt right. had that not happened. But I still don't think that's a great reason. No, you know what I, I'm saying? Right. So it's right. a weird, it's a weird concept. Total weird, right. It's a weird concept. I get it though. Yeah. And, and I hear it a lot. 
So there must be something to it if people are saying it, yeah. you know? So uh, just putting my own thoughts out there. Yeah. And then I think at least like for me, kind of taking something so negative and trying to turn it into the best positive that I could be, yeah. that was obviously a coping mechanism for me to start, right? But throughout therapy, right, it turned into this beautiful thing. Yeah. Um, it becomes like a mission almost. It it really, like, really does. Because yeah. I never set out to be an inspiration in any way, shape, or form. But after, you know, my surgeries, I returned slowly back to work for about two months. And corporate. corporate. That job. Yep. That job. And it was just not conducive. I was working way too many hours a day. I was not healing my nerves, right? I'm typing all the time. You can't heal your mm. nerves when you're typing. Um, right. So one day I just kind of woke up and I was like, I can't. I need to be true to myself if I'm going to continue this journey on, you know. Good for you. Feeling, you know, comfortable in whatever this new Robin looks like. Like you need to give yourself some TLC for once because yeah. you're not. So I told my husband, I said, I'm, look at you putting yourself first. Right. So this was like such a huge learning. Like <laughs> when I tell you, I had a moment this morning where I pulled into my car or pulled into my driveway and I thought you are not the person that you were three, four years ago. I'm so, and I yeah. said it to myself, I was like, I'm so proud of who you are today, Robin. Good for you. And I, and I never would have thought I would be here today. Right. So, you know, up and left corporate, did not have a plan, did not have another job lined up. I just needed to focus on what made me happy. And no surprise there, it always came back to helping people. So, but for me, right, I was still at that time only able to lift six months after my surgery, 10 pounds with my hand, with my arm. I physically could not lift more than that. Right. So I made it my mission to get stronger, get my strength back. I had to reteach myself everything with my left hand, how to open a door, how to turn a faucet on. Still to this day, I mean, I can't hold my arm up for a very long period of time because it becomes painful. Um, mm -hmm. But I made it my mission to just do more with my hands, obviously in a safe environment right. and taking care of myself still. But every single day was, what are we going to do today to make you happy, to put you first, and to make your health a priority? So within six months, my life had 360 flipped. And now I was becoming, you know, the new Robin. And through all of this, through this newfound confidence that I had experienced, right, because of this horrible situation turned amazing, I got the confidence. Everyone around me, again, my village said, start your own business. Mm -hmm. What's the worst thing that's going to happen? You start it for a couple of years and it doesn't work out. At least you can say you tried. So for me... I wanted to continue working with my hands and I wanted to help people and do what I love. Bam, charcuterie company cheese. came to be in cheese. So on an everyday basis, right, we are breaking down wheels of cheese. I'm prepping with my hands. I'm folding salami. I'm constantly working with my hands now on a day-to-day -day like basis. like physical therapy through your work. Exactly. That's exactly That's kind of how I looked at it. Yeah. Um, and I mean, to this day, you know, we, we book wed it. We're booking weddings. We are doing, you know, 150 plus person grazing tables. Like we are we're awesome. slammed, which is amazing. But none of this would have ever happened in a million years if it weren't for this horrible thing that happened to me. Because right. I'd probably still be corporate, loving the paycheck, right? We all love our corporate paycheck, but nothing was soul fulfilling to me. And that was always my issue. So now, you know, to this day, Again, every day I try to bake in some level of something for me, whether it's five minutes of peace and quiet or reflection, whether it's a meditation, whether it's a face Old Robin mask. would not do that. Oh, Old Robin never. Old Robin would be like, all right, you have to get your nails done. Okay, it looks like in three weeks from now, we can maybe squeeze it in here. Yeah, now, but 20 minute window, we can put that in. Exactly. Now it's like, no, no. We're doing a pampered yeah. day. We are blocking my day off from work and we are having ourselves a day. Because why? Because you deserve it. Because you went through yeah. hell and back and you're here. And that's what right. matters. Right. Um, now, I mean, it really, it ties back to what you were saying at the beginning of like, you have this lovely, beautiful, chaotic, messy, mm -hmm. 
fly by the seat of your pants sometimes life that probably never would have been in four year ago Robin's mind that right. like that would be how you would exist in the world and be happy about it. Right. And I think there's something really beautiful about that. There is. And kind of, you know, throughout telling my story over the last two years, like I said earlier, I never, ever set out to be an inspiration. But I know a couple of people who have told me directly that they have quit their corporate jobs and pursued their passions because of me. And when someone if she told, can do it. Yeah. And someone, yeah. Someone said, like, if Robin could do it, I could do it. And uh, sorry, I'm getting really emotional. So for me, I was always kind of, you know, the one like on the side observing, right? Like I never thought I'd be the reason why someone would do something. You were something. the cheerleader before. Right. I was always the cheerleader, never the leader. And I was always fine with being the cheerleader, but it's so humbling. And, yeah. you know, really kind of through this, Matt, I want, I, I obviously I don't want what happened to me to happen to anyone. It was the worst experience right. I could ever go through. Right. But I want people to know that just because society tells us one thing doesn't mean we have to do it. Just because, you know, you go to college, you need to get a job. That doesn't need to look like nine to five. That can be whatever you want it to be. You go through a crazy life event. You're also not alone. We may not go through the exact same event, but I've been literally on the floor crying because I'm in so much excruciating pain and I'm so depressed. I've been there. Mm -hmm. um, and I want people to know that it gets better. It takes time. And when you're in it, you don't see that. So I always try to kind of, you know, I have friends who are to this day in a dark depression still from obviously things happening all the time. We all have friends that are depressed, right? And I try to just make that effort of checking in because, you know, when I was so depressed, sometimes I would just say, I just want someone to say, like, I believe in you. Like, mm. you got this, right? And we never do that. Society trains us to just live our lives and not really check in on that mental health aspect. Yeah. And I think there's also an element of people that... I think if we as a society had more faith in sharing all the parts yep. with each other publicly, being vulnerable, like admitting, like, I'm not great today, yep. but I know that's okay yep. because life is not all super highs or exactly. super lows. And, you know, there's, and I think the more we talk about how we feel, the more we answer honestly when someone says, how are you? You know, like the more we do that and normalize that it's not always good. Thanks. How are you? But like today really sucks and here's why. And thanks for asking. Exactly. I think we can get to a place in which people feel more comfortable being more like you describe, you know, and helping others in a way that maybe is not intentional. Like I'm out here to try to help you. I just care. Yeah. You know, I just want to share. So, you know, I think, I think it's, it's weird to say great that you found this new version of you it, it, through such a it really terrible great, experience. Though. It is great. Yeah. You had but to go through something. the way you had to get there. Exactly. That's what I, yeah, exactly. It sucks that you had but to. But at the same time, it's like, do you think your life would have just continued to be just busy, 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 you know? percent. Yep. Until you hit the, like, and Until then I had a burnout. you're going to hit a wall, right? Yep. Exactly. Yeah. I'm wondering if you could go back to Robin that's sitting alone in her hospital room, just like spiraling, like what, how am I going to get to work? How am I going to get that project done? How am I going to get my arm fixed? How am I going to tell my family? Is there anything that like this version of you would want to tell her whisper in her ear or would you just want to let, let it all unfold? Um, I would probably just continue to say like, it's going to be okay. I know you can't see it right now, but you need to trust the process. Hmm. Every body is different. Everyone heals differently. Everyone reacts to everything differently. That's the issue with medicine, right? No one can give you a definitive answer because no two people are alike. Right. So what I think I would just tell her is, you got this. You are stronger than you ever could have imagined. 
people look up to you. Heck, mm. my own mother, I can't tell you the amount of times that she made me cry because she just kept saying like, you are my idol right now. I mm. could never go through what you went through or what you're going through. And I would just tell her like, you're strong. You're a strong ass woman. You got yeah. this girlfriend. Yeah. Like yeah. just keep going because it's going to get better. You're going to live out your dream that you never even knew you had. <laughs> you didn't even know you I had I didn't it, even right? know I ever wanted to own my own business. And here I am. And it's so just like, pinch me. Like a couple months ago, I did a new segment and it debuted on Valentine's Day about my thoracic outlets journey. And I know it's kind of tied in my grandmother yeah. with all, like, yeah. all of that. It's just, it's such an emotional, crazy, amazing roller coaster. Yeah. That... Yeah, just just keep doing it, girlfriend. You yeah. will get there. I promise you. It sucks, but don't sit in the mud. You will get mm. there. Yeah. Just keep going. I think it's important. One foot in front of the other. That's what I tell myself on a daily basis. <laughs> <laughs> and that's good. That's how that's how we we can only live in the present, right? Yeah. So like find pick the things that we want to do that make us happy, that bring us joy. There are gonna be things that we don't want to do that we have to do. Right. Do them yep. and then focus on the things that you want to. Before you tell us how we can connect with you, please just tell everyone what your email signature sign off is because I love it <laughs> so much. And then you can tell us how of to course. contact you. So like I said earlier, we're fun, we're classy, but we like to, you know, poke some fun at everything, right? So my email sign off is Brie Awesome and Stay Cheesy. I love it. It's so good. Um, <laughs> so if people want to learn more about what you offer, I mean, I don't know, is it all just local at this um, point? Yeah. Yeah. So at this point in okay. time, we do kind of, you know, driving deliveries. We're not shipping at this point in time, but if you're in the, cool. you know, the local mass North Shore area, definitely, you know, reach out. And also if people just want to connect for personal reasons, please yeah. reach out. I would yeah. love. Tell us how to do that. Yep. Yeah. So for me, you're going to reach out to at boards for days, B-O-A-R-D-S. F-O-R-D-A-Y-S underscore on Instagram. You can also ha hit us up, hello at boardsfordays.com. Check out our wow. website, of course, boardsfordays.com. Yeah. And we're also on Facebook, as you guessed it, at Boards for Days. <laughs> we'll put all yeah. those links too in the show notes <laughs> so people can easily access it. And, you know, I think for your business sake, if they're local, definitely check that out. Mm -hmm see what she's doing, support her on Instagram and, and socials and things like that. But also if you're going through a moment or you're maybe you're facing the same exact condition and you want to talk through it, or you want to see like, you know, compare war stories or whatever yeah. it may be. I know that Robin would want to hear from you and connect with you. So please take advantage of that, yes, whether she's going to gonna say it out loud or not. Okay. <laughs> Because I think that's so important. This connections and, and feeling like we aren't alone is so important. So It'll help important. with the, depressive feelings or those other feelings that come about in other ways. So please take advantage of that. I think, I think that's it. I think we've, we've hit this place. Thank you yeah. so much for sharing your story and sharing multiple, like they were like incremental little shifts they that were. kind of got you to this like it just kept turning it yep. a little bit. Can't see what I'm doing if you're listening, but <laughs> I'm just like turning something in front of my face. But it feels like each one was a notch getting you closer to this version of you. So thank you for sharing your story. Thank you guys for listening to the Life Shift Podcast. If if you enjoy this show or it's your first time here, if you could give me a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, I would love that. But with that, I will say goodbye for now. I'll be back next week with a brand new episode and we'll see you then. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Robin. Thank you. Brie Osman, stay cheesy. I love it. For more information, please visit www.thelifeshiftpodcast.com.